unmute myself here. Well, welcome everyone to uh, the Carnegie discussion of how can middle power democracies renovate global democracy support. It's a timely topic. Um, we are in a period of severe democratic recession, as I'm sure most of you watching this know. Not only have we been in democratic recession for well over a decade, but this last year, according to Freedom House, which full disclosure, I sit on the board, um, but uh, Freedom House has said this last year was the worst for democratic recession of, of any modern year um, in the, since, uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. VDEM um, says that only 14% of the world's population, just 32 countries, are living in what we now consider liberal democracies. Um, the, both of those, Freedom House and VDEM, downgraded India to electoral autocracy or just partially free. That's 1.37 billion people. Brazil, Turkey, America, also major, major declines. We're seeing declines in the heart of Europe and in the EU, places like Hungary, which is no longer considered free by Freedom House, Poland, very fast decline. And so this problem of how do we regain democracy's mojo? How do we push democracy forward in an era in which we're seeing these very fast uh, reductions is increasingly important. It's important because the threats to democracy are coming from within and without and because there's a network effect here. As one country goes, particularly very large countries um, like India, they pull other countries into an orbit in which it becomes easier and easier for others to slide as well. And so this network effect means that we could see acceleration. In our recent paper at Carnegie, we singled out a whole series of tough internal challenges that democracies are facing, a whole series of new demands hands for greater social justice, greater uh, governance delivery. Um, the US and to a lesser extent, places like Britain or France are being internally discredited and they're lacking more pull power. Uh, after January 6th, it is hard to state that strongly enough um, for our, our own country. But then you have countries like El Salvador where only 28% claim that democracy is their preferred form of government and where you have populist authoritarians winning in landslide elections where uh, if outsiders claim that they're standing for democracy, they seem to be critiquing the will of the people. And that creates a very strong uh, difficulty for people trying to support democracy from overseas. And these movements of populist authoritarians, this split between majoritarian instincts and the liberal aspects of democracy are making it harder and harder for outsiders to support democracy without taking a stance in internal politics. There's also, of course, a tougher geopolitical climate. Democracies aren't just dying from within, they're being helped on that from without. Russia is very happy to push this internal dissension that we're facing in our democracies in many, many ways. Um, they're pushing far-right groups, supporting far-right political parties, supporting many kinds of internal dissension. China's more authoritarian development model, its Belt and Road initiatives are helping kleptocratic and political marketplace systems. Um, and then COVID, on top all of this, allowed a third of countries to impose emergency measures without any time limit. So the world, while more democratic than it was in the 70s and 80s, uh, is uh, really facing difficulties. And yet, in the 70s and 80s, it was able to mount a very strong response to the reduction in, um, or to the, to the authoritarian forces that were mounted against it at that time, and able to move toward a more democratic world that we enjoyed throughout the 90s, 2000s, 2010s. And so the question on the table now for our speakers is what can we do now? What can we do when we're in a similar era of declining support for democracy, a lot of lack of confidence at home, serious external geopolitical challenge. Our Carnegie paper laid out some ideas about solidarity, standing with other democracies, sometimes quite concretely, like supporting places such as Australia when their trade was threatened, um, countries whose gas might be cut off by autocratic countries or whose citizens might be jailed, focusing on adjacent policy areas in which countries already excel, like economic uh, recovery from COVID, injustice, digital repression, 
and looking at diplomatic cooperation that's flexible but focused. Um, UN areas, but also new multilateral fora, the Quad, the Alliance for Multilateralism. And that was really expressed very beautifully, I think, in the latest uh, Magnitsky sanctions that the EU, Canada, UK, the US all managed to put together um, toward China for its uh, repression of Muslims and Uyghurs uh, quite recently. Um, and then when it's hard for middle powers to directly act on democracy because of um, the geopolitical challenges, focusing on democracy adjacent areas, using their uh, track two tools, reviving narratives of democratic success and so on. To speak to all of these issues in greater depth, we have three terrific speakers who can represent America, Canada and the EU, but can also just represent themselves with a great deal of depth in each of these areas. Um, I'll introduce them all and um, in the order they'll be speaking. So Lisa Peterson will kick us off. Uh, she is a senior official or the senior official, I should say, for uh, leading the civilian security, democracy and human rights portion of the State Department. And she's the acting assistant secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. She's been an FSO uh, Foreign Service officer since 1989. She served throughout the agency in a whole series of assignments that are fascinating in this arena, largely across Africa with a particular focus on democracy, human rights and peace. So there's really no one better at the State Department to address this set of issues. Roland Paris is a professor at the University of Ottawa where he's also the founder of the Center for International Policy Studies. Previously, he was a senior advisor to Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada. And he was director of research before that at Canada's largest think tank, and advised on Canada-US relations with the Canadian Foreign Ministry in their cabinet office. And Ken Godfrey is the executive director of the European Partnership for Democracy. He's been that since 2015. Earlier, he served at the United Nations with the European Parliament and consulted to the European Commission. And so we're just thrilled to have these three speakers address this really tough challenge of our time. The world's at an inflection point. What do we do? With that question, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, I wanna commend Carnegie for raising this timely and important topic and framing possible approaches. And I'm delighted to be here to share the Biden administration's perspective. The United States knows that our leadership and engagement on global issues matter. We've heard this from our allies and partners. They, they seem to be glad that we're back. Um, we know, too, that in our absence from key forums such as the UN Human Rights Council, other democracies continued to carry forward the work of defending human rights and driving progress on a range of global issues. We welcome other democracies taking the lead on such key issues. For example, we commend Canada and the United Kingdom for launching the Media Freedom Coalition and leading a global campaign to bolster efforts to promote media freedom and the safety of journalists. The United States is committed to working within the international community and its global and regional bodies, as well as with non-governmental stakeholders to address the world's greatest present and future challenges. This means responding to challenges posed by adversarial powers, as well as confronting hostile non-state actors. It also includes working to mitigate threats that respect no national borders such as climate change, infectious disease, cyber attacks, and disinformation. We recognize, however, that no global challenge can be met by any one nation acting alone. Facing these challenges requires countries cooperating and collaborating in common cause. That's why the United States is leading with diplomacy, reaffirming, reinforcing, and reinvigorating our alliances and partnerships and standing shoulder to shoulder with like-minded allies and partners to face shared challenges and uphold our shared values and a rules-based international order. We recognize also that the countries best equipped to meet global challenges are democracies. Resolute democracies that respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, uphold rule of law, promote equality for members of marginalized and underrepresented populations and protect groups in vulnerable situations. Democratic societies are more open, inclusive, accountable, and resilient. They're less vulnerable to foreign malign influence and less prone to conflict. 
These are our best partners across the spectrum of global issues. We know too well from our own experience that sustaining democracy requires hard work, careful stewardship, and constant vigilance. This is why the Biden administration is putting promoting and protecting democracy at the center of US foreign policy. As President Biden said, the United States will stand up for democracy wherever it is under attack. We're committed to democratic renewal at home and abroad, and we hold ourselves as well as our allies and partners accountable to our commitments to promote, respect, and defend human rights and fundamental freedoms. This is where the role of middle power democracies proves so crucial to sustained democracy promotion strategies. But I wanna stress that respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms are not just the values of the United States and other Western democracies, they are universal values. The global community in its adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights more than 70 years ago agreed on the importance of human rights and the need for all governments, no matter the size or location, to uphold them. And of course, advancing the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms also defends and strengthens democracy. These efforts are mutually reinforcing. So for example, when we work to advance women's access to justice, we are addressing an immediate human rights concern, but we are also building a democratic muscle. Democratic allies and partners can cooperate to shore up the foundations of democracy in three key ways. First, we need to redouble efforts to defend and strengthen the international rules based based order that was built over decades. That includes fostering democratic and global resilience to attempts to exploit the free and open rules of our democratic systems. And it means consistently and comprehensively responding to attempts to reshape the international system to favor repressive authoritarian aims. We can best deploy the right mix of offense and defense in this effort if we are acting in concert with others. Second, we need to redouble our efforts to promote democratic governance, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and rule of law by holding ourselves and others accountable. We must all speak up when governments, including our friends and allies, backslide from democracy and rule of law. We must promote accountability for violations and abuses of human rights and fundamental freedoms. We must help countries strengthen the safeguards of democracy, including free and independent media, anti-corruption mechanisms, vibrant civic space, inclusive accountable governance, and independent institutions that protect and uphold the rule of law. And I think this is where middle power democracies have really played a crucial sustaining role. Third, we all need to lead by example. We must undertake the at times uncomfortable work of self-reflection and introspection. We must identify our deeply rooted problems and the key reforms needed to address them. And we must all do the necessary things to make our governments more transparent and accountable and our societies more equitable, just, and inclusive, including amending bad laws, fighting corruption, and rejecting intolerance and discrimination within our systems and societies. As we shore up these democratic foundations, we aim to strengthen our cooperation in global intergovernmental bodies like the United Nations and in regional intergovernmental organizations. This is why the United States announced our candidacy for a seat on the UN Human Rights Council in the election slated for October of this year. It's a key part of how we intend to reinvigorate US diplomacy in support of a foreign policy centered on democracy, human rights, and equality. And it's a way in which we might help amplify middle power actions. We also seek to strengthen our cooperation through multi-stakeholder initiatives. These forms foster the whole of society approach. They leverage government collaboration with non-governmental actors. The United States and like-minded partners engage in and support several multi-stakeholder initiatives including the Community of Democracies, the Equal Rights Coalition, the Freedom Online Coalition, uh, the Global Action on Disability Network, and the Open Government Partnership. These initiatives offer both the opportunity to enhance collaboration with middle power democracies, 
and advance what the paper refers to as democracy adjacent issues. As part of our commitment to democratic renewal at home and abroad, the president's planned summit for democracy will bring together allies and partners from government, civil society, and the private sector around a common agenda to defend democracy, including concrete commitments on combating corruption, pushing back on authoritarianism, and advancing human rights at home and abroad. Participating countries will be expected to deliver on both international and domestic commitments that advance these goals. We hope the summit will be a catalyst for revitalizing democracy both at home and abroad, and that it can help bolster the initiatives of middle power democracies. Thanks again for the chance to participate in this discussion, and I look forward to Roland and Ken's insights and recommendations. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was terrific. It's terrific to hear how much the US is back. Um, I would love to move on to Roland, who hopefully can both reflect on uh, Lisa's comments in the paper, but also I would love for you to bring in your own terrific paper um, on how or whether middle powers can save the liberal world order through Chatham House. I think that was published. Um, so that's my plug. I hope uh, it can be put in the um, comments for everyone to see because it's really terrific and very actionable. Um, over to you, Roland. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for the plug. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for having written your paper, which I think is a really important contribution. And, uh, and I appreciated uh, Lisa's remarks as well. And, and this uh, promises to be an interesting discussion. Uh, you know, when we're thinking about this broad domain of what you and others and I have been calling democracy support, um, you know, it's really part of a larger challenge, I think, uh, where there are three areas of action needed. Uh, the first is to deal with the crisis of confidence within many established democracies uh, and to make sure that uh, these democratic systems, our own democratic systems, are working for our own people. Uh, that has very much been an emphasis of the Biden administration uh, and of Joe Biden before he came into power. I think it's a very important starting place. It's what I would call the home, ga the home game part of uh, democracy support. The second requirement is for democratic states to collectively defend against the efforts of some emboldened authoritarians to disrupt our democratic processes or to target individual democracies for uh, economic punishment or coercion, including by taking their citizens as de facto hostages. And the support of the United States, active support of the United States, is absolutely crucial in this respect uh, for middle powers. The third area is, I think, the one that, we're, that you and your paper are really talking about when you're talking about democracy support. Uh, especially in countries where democratic systems have a tenuous hold. And uh, the, the choice of the language democracy support is important and, and interesting in order to differentiate it from the democracy promotion of the 1990s. And part of the challenge is actually to map out what is the nature of a democracy support agenda today, given the kinds of challenges that we're facing, given the democratic recession that you uh, referenced, and given the fact that the way in which democracy promotion has been, in some cases, pursued in the past has tainted it. Yet, we can't simply turn away from the ideas of democracy support outside of our own countries, because you know, turning inwards, entering a defensive crouch is, is really not an option either. So where is this space between the seemingly discredited democracy promotion agenda of the past and the kind of democracy defense, uh, internal defense, uh, uh, that has been the, the predominant uh, focus of recent times. So for countries like Canada and for, I think, you know, we'll hear from Ken, but for some members of the EU, for the UK and for others, the challenge as you mark out in your paper is to come together, to work together in various combinations and with civil society partners to assist those countries, those fragile democracies that want help and to do so in a way that really plays to the comparative advantage 
of the middle powers uh, in certain areas. To some extent, this is already happening. Lisa mentioned the, the Canada, the UK launched a media freedom coalition in 2019. And I think the second meeting of that coalition took place late last year, and it was hosted by Canada and Botswana. But your report, Rachel, is right to say that much more needs to be done. And while the leadership of the United States is crucial, other democracies should not wait for the US when it comes to building out uh, a collaborative democracy support agenda. In effect, the onus is on all of our countries to identify areas where we have something to offer, whether it's the ability to convene or expertise in particular areas or relationships in particular parts of the world, and then to build task-specific coalitions to enable countries that want support to receive it. And wherever possible to include in those coalitions countries outside the West, like Botswana, as full participants and uh, contributors. But the biggest challenge today uh, is less about the design of constitutions and electoral systems, although, of course, the integrity of electoral systems is important. I would argue it's more about helping democratic countries deliver for their own people to provide personal security, to provide health care, to provide economic opportunity, particularly during and after this global pandemic. Because if democracy itself is perceived as ineffective, which is precisely what China and Russia have been arguing or peddling, then the democratic recession will only accelerate. So the potential scope of this democracy support agenda is enormous. But that brings me back to the point that I was making before about how individual mid-sized powers can mobilize coalitions in areas where they have a real contribution to make, possibility to make a difference. Take Canada, for example. Although many Canadians might disagree with this, uh, we benefit from a professional public administration that's one of the most effective in the world. It, you know, it's one of those facts about Canada that is simultaneously very boring and very remarkable. You know, what's more, uh, many fragile democracies have asked Canada for technical assistance on how to manage programs, on how to improve their budgeting, on revenue collection. You know, this is pretty prosaic stuff. It's democracy adjacent, as you say in your paper, Rachel. And of course, the idea of governance capacity building is not new. But the argument for making this a centerpiece of a renewed push for democracy support is very strong. As another example of how middle powers can think about focusing in their efforts, Canada has strong relationships in different parts of the world, including, for example, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I can imagine Canada working alongside the United States and other countries and civil society partners to address some of the enormous governance challenges facing Central American countries, for example. So to sum up, this effort is going to require supporters of democracy to step up, to contribute what they can, and to lead the creation of coalitions on specific issues and with different partners. It is an enormous task. And yes, it does start from home. But if we allow ourselves to be daunted by the size of the task, or if we let sit back and wait for others to take action, or if we become so consumed by our own domestic challenges that we end up turning inwards, then others will certainly fill the void that we're leaving behind. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, and again, I commend your paper to, to all the listeners here too. Um, now we have the uh, advantage of getting to sit back and think and pontificate about these things. Ken is in the trenches, doling out the money and doing the strategy. And so Ken, um, what are your thoughts on um, these ideas? in the papers and that Lisa's presented here about um, what we can do to meet this moment in, in history and regain some, some democratic strategic alignment on these issues of pushing democracy forward in the world today. Thanks very much, Rachel. I don't know if I have any silver bullets, but uh, I'll try and offer up some, 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 some ideas. Uh, very interested to hear Lisa and Roland's remarks. Um, 
maybe I, I'd start by saying that I think Roland's right that, you know, if you have this sort of basket of middle powers, quite a few of them would be European. I think quite a few of them, unfortunately, would be Western European and not Central and Eastern European, which is, I, you know, a shame for the European Union as a global actor. Uh, what I would say, however, is the fact that I think that there is a moment, a political moment in Europe at the moment where a uh, lot of the countries are very cognizant of the challenges to democracy within Europe, but also externally. And I feel as though it is a time to a good sort of the, the moment is ripe for greater coordination and, and cooperation on the international stage, at least from a European perspective. Uh, Reflecting on the paper, I'd say that maybe there are two recommendations which I'd say something about. One of them, Roland has, has sort of gone into quite a bit of detail on regarding specific coherent policy areas where it'd be wise for middle powers to cooperate. I think that that's a very sensible recommendation. I would also, I would say from European experience, at least there are some areas where I think that would be easier than others. So for example, I think it would, uh, it's probably easier in the climate sphere, for example, as well as in the digital sphere, considering the sort of the nature of those challenges. I do feel that, for example, in, the, in, in terms of corruption, it's quite difficult. The European Union, for example, has had lots of difficulty trying to address sort of tax havens, predominantly because many of them are located within the European Union. So, you know, that those there will be challenges on a number of different sort of policy areas, which I think some will, could move fast and some will take a, take a bit more time. On the, maybe this, another one of the recommendations which is on solidarity. Now, I think that in some senses, this, the solidarity question is very new in the fact that there is a far more assertiveness of authoritarian powers on the international stage. And there sort of this, the, I would guess the sort of chilling effect probably requires a bit more scholarly as well as political attention. At the same time, from the perspective of European states, the sort of trade-offs that are required to engage in solidarity with other countries are nothing new, really. You know, the, those, those energy concerns in the European neighborhood, trade concerns, importance of cooperation on climate with China, all of those remain. And so those hierarchy of priorities is where the, I would see their being sort of a challenge for many democracies. And when we think about sort of operationalizing, so how do we operationalize arriving at a common agreement on some of these, some of these issues? I think there's a bit of a tension between those two recommendations. And the reason that I say that is that I think that arriving at common positions on particular policy issues is possible in certain fora. I think that arriving at measures of solidarity is much harder in those type of fora because they don't look at the bigger picture. They look at one particular issue and they don't consider the trade-offs. And when one thinks about the sort of solidarity in general, uh, it's very hard for me to see from a European experience. So the European Union has clear mechanisms, structures to help leaders and nation states arrive at common positions. Without those structures, and even with those structures, it's difficult. Without those structures, I think it would be very, very tricky. And so at the moment, I think there are a plethora of different initiatives bringing together democracies. So there's a community of democracy, alliance of democracies. There's friends of democracy, alliance for multilateralism, uh, D10 initiative. All of those are all well and good. But I do feel as though enhancing solidarity between democracies. However, maybe we could have a discussion about what that looks like. It would be difficult if spread out across multiple different policy uh, uh, areas and without one clear structure. I think maybe the Summit for Democracy is an opportunity for, for that type of uh, uh, solidarity in the, longer, in the longer run. Maybe let me end on the fact that sort of what uh, both uh, other speakers have mentioned as the, the problems at home. The paper mentions it too. I mean, it's clearly very stark in the case of the European Union and countries around Europe. There are significant challenges. I also do think, though, that it is very much an opportunity because of the fact that this cooperation must be beyond nation states. So it needs to think for pragmatic reasons. It needs to think about this. Who's to say who will be in power in France or Italy in the next five years? And I, I'm not saying that lightly. 
And who is to say who will be in, in power in Poland? You know, Poland may become a reinvigorated actor supporting democracy on the international scene in the next five years. And so for those reasons, I really think that the, that cooperation should be beyond the nation state. And I think for many of these middle powers, that sort of the idea of soft power on values is something that they hold very dear to, to their foreign policy and also their, their image ar around the world. And therefore, I would see this as something where there could be much greater cooperation at trying to build those sort of coalitions that, that Roland mentioned. What I would say, though, is that democracy support has been functioning in multiple countries around the world for quite a long time now. I would say that the challenge practically is not one of technical uh, understanding very often of the way that change occurs. It's a very political challenge. And so there, I think that those coalitions are doubly important because they set the ground in the long term for actual sustainable change, for support for democratic principles. Now, saying all of that, I'm very much agreement with, with Roland and the fact that we need to demonstrate democracies can deliver for their citizens. And the pandemic has really brought that into stark, uh, you know, the, the contrast compared to maybe what would have been said uh, 10 years ago. And so focusing on that is also a big challenge. And there, I think that the papers write that, you know, focusing on concrete policy areas will help in that in, in that effort. So I think I'll leave my, my remarks uh, there for the moment and look forward to the discussion. Thank you all so much. We're already in great questions in the comments section. I encourage others to keep the comments happening. Um, I have a lot of questions myself that I would love to pose. So I will start off with moderator's privilege, but I'm going to quickly start pulling in others. Um, and if you want to get a sneak preview, the other speakers can look to the comments section. Um, so Lisa, I wanted to, to start with you. And we've heard from our European friends and our Canadian allies about um, their different perspectives on this issue. And I just wanted to ask you, do you feel it's enough are you hoping that at the Democracy Summit, you can, um, you being your, the officials within the United States government, can garner even greater support for um, particular activities that we'd like to see um, building toward a greater, uh, a greater strategic directionality? Or do you think this is exactly what we're looking for, is this sort of um, uh, types of activities that Roland and Ken have already been pointing toward? You know, I think the summit is a good sort of galvanizing event. And, and our hope is that some of the pledges and commitments that go into um, people sort of getting their, their ticket for admission um, create some sort of longer term commitment, both to what countries are doing inside and how they are engaging externally. Um, but I also think we are, we're realistic that, you know, the summit is, it's not intended to create some kind of new infrastructure. And so I think it is critical that, that as we're formulating what the summit looks like, we are mindful of those kinds of longer term policy engagements, areas where, where citizens can focus on learning what levers they need to pull to get their governments pointed in a better direction. Um, levers that are more than getting out to the streets, because if people have gotten out to the streets, then a lot of other steps of levers have been missed along the way. Um, so I, I think, I hope that the summit will be a useful addition and uh, something that helps pull together some focus or some coordination across initiatives that are already happening. But I think those individual policy level engagements, the individual um, democracy, sorry, it wasn't promotion, it was support. <laughs> um, Individual democracy support efforts are going to obviously have to carry on and be that longer, 
sustaining process. I also think, um, you know, we may all need to take another look at even just the way we are talking about um, democracy. You know, I find even among my colleagues, we all know that democracy is not elections, but little snippets of, well, we need to find ways to get youth into elected office. And if we're talking about a democracy promotion strategy, but no one's talking about elections, we've, we've missed the mark. And I do think that there needs to be more focus on what I am increasingly calling citizen participation between elections. And I think this is um, particularly for the United States. Um, people have forgotten all of the things that have to happen in those years between elections and the ways that they need to continue being engaged. You can't just show up every four years and tick a box and expect everything to go the way you thought it was going to go. Um, and I think thinking more carefully about how we are working in that space um, is, is also something crucial for sustainability on democracy support efforts. Thank you. Roland, you ticked off a whole series of very practical steps that could be taken. And um, that's also my mindset too, is kind of let's roll up our, our sleeves and start uh, putting on this play. Um, but uh, one thing you didn't mention was the narrative, the ideas space. And I wonder if this is a, something we're really leaving out here because I remember early on when, as soon as the pandemic hit, the first paper I wrote was on um, whether democracies or autocracies were doing better. And at that point, there was a big push largely from to say that whatever had happened at the beginning of the pandemic, they had gotten their hands on it quickly and had put it under control and, and um, the democracies were clearly flailing a lot. And, and that was the narrative that was um, being pushed forward. And in my paper, I suggested that that wasn't all the reality, that democracies were all over the map and how they were dealing with it. So were autocracies and that trust was really what mattered um, as well as just competence and government and so on, as you said. Um, but what it, the, the uh, susceptibility of the global public to that narrative makes it very clear that there is not a sense that first of all, democracies are generally more competent at delivering services on a whole host of things. And we have that empirical basis. We could make ourselves more competent through some of the uh, techniques that you mentioned, but also that there's a narrative that's been lost of the ways in which democracies are good at certain things. And part of that losing narrative is happening right now, right before we all joined you in the public sphere, we were talking about the vaccine distribution in our own countries. And it will come as no surprise that the Europeans and the Canadians are more frustrated than the Americans are right now. It, you know, the tables were flipped just a few short months ago. Um, so this perhaps has uh, as much to do with our administrations as, as with our regimes. But um, the narrative that I was worried about at the beginning of the pandemic us doing so poorly is now a narrative that's continuing with Canada and the Europeans doing poorly on the vaccine distribution that can still be used against. So what I'm wondering is how do we start building a narrative of democratic competence, um, of democratic ability to deliver that matches the empirics when the empirics are shaky on certain key issues that are more in the public's eye and some of the empirics that we know to be true, but are, are uh, more in the background or less um, prevalent to people? Yeah, well, that's a tremendous question. Um, you know, I, I think with regard to how the pandemic fits into the very questions that you're asking about perceptions of democracy and the empirics and how that aligns with the reputation of democracy, I mean, the jury is out. We've seen that month to month, perceptions of how countries are doing in relation to the pandemic has changed. Look at Britain itself. It was falling flat on its face. And now, you know, it's got this tremendous vaccination rate. So let's wait a little bit on something that is uh, fundamentally transitory. I mean, we will come out of this uh, pandemic. But I think you're pointing at something, a broader issue, which is a combination of a, of a, of a kind of a crisis of confidence in democracy within some portions of our populations within established democracies and a performance question. 
you know, like it's the empirical performance, but it's also this idea, are, are we ourselves enthusiastic about the idea of democracy, about all the ideas of uh, liberty and freedom and accountable government and rights that are built into the idea of democracy? This is a tough moment for that. So, you know, part of the challenge in response, in dealing with that crisis of confidence is to have leaders remind us of why it is so important as a good in itself, but also be, to be showing that they are able to deliver for their people. So I think that this is a bit of a, you know, there's, a, there's not a lot of silver linings on this pandemic, but remember this crisis of confidence predates the pandemic, but the pandemic is such a shock that it provides in a way opportunities for democratic governments and other, other governments to rethink how they are working in some ways. We're seeing shifts in the way that some countries are thinking about the role of government in relation to the economy, in relation to social supports, in relation to the nature of the welfare state in an era where work is changing and some kinds of work are disappearing. It is a moment of, in a way, there is a moment of creativity that's coming along with the destruction. So I think at this, at this nadir, in a way, of this global pandemic and in the wake of, uh, you know, uh, no offense, Lisa, an incredibly destructive uh, Trump presidency, both for the United States and for allies of the United States and for everybody else, in the wake of this, you know, this extraordinary uh, pushback uh, and, and um, you know, overconfidence of some uh, authoritarian countries. You know, this is a tough moment, but we, this is a long story. And uh, having the sense that it is possible for us to address the concerns that our own populations have about how our systems are addressing their, their, their needs, their anxieties, their concerns. The recommitting and re reminding ourselves of what is it essentially about democracy that is so important to us, and then re-engaging a democracy support agenda, which seeks to provide assistance to countries that want assistance, and having middle powers playing an active role in that, because you, we can't wait for the United States, and we've seen the United States might have changing positions from time to time. I think that that's the recipe for, for the best hope for moving out of this um, out of this um, malaise, as Jimmy Carter once put it. And it was, of course, right after and and toward the end. Actually, people forget that some of the build up toward democracy was at the end of the Carter administration. Um, that we started to formulate as de democracies plans for how to create democratic strategy that got us out of both that malaise and also out of the bipolar world that we were stuck in back then. So I think it is uh, it is an apropos time to be considering these same questions. Ken, I wanna start turning to our questioners and Blair King poses a question that falls into your warehouse, wheelhouse, which is um, Hungary and uh, to a lesser extent Poland, although he doesn't bring it up, which, which is, you know, we, we're looking at the EU and at the EU member states to be projecting more globally a uh, pro-democracy stand. Yet within the EU, we're seeing this backsliding. Now I say this with a lot of humility because within America, within our own member states, um, we're dealing with Georgia and Texas and Arizona and, and our own significant problems. So this is a finger, um, but this is a real problem. And so what is being done within the EU, if anything, to address the backsliding internally and uh, hold the, the wall as it were. And if one can't hold the wall within the EU and, and member states get the benefits of the EU while being able to erode democratic um, norms internally, what does that mean for its ability to project externally? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I don't know how much the uh, person posing the question knows of the sort of history of the last few years, but I would say that there have been attempts that have been made. The decision-making structure of the European Union means that it's decidedly difficult uh, when there are two countries which have a particular problem because then they can use their veto within the Council of the European Union to eliminate any some 
moves that the European Union might take in order to combat uh, backsliding. The recently, so at the end of last year, uh, member states agreed to link the rollout of the new EU budget to the rule of law. And that means it's a, so the mechanism is not as strong as it should have been, but uh, it is a new tool for the EU to use to uh, ensure that funds are not given to uh, Hungary uh, uh, and Poland should there be demonstrations of rule of law backsliding. And in the case of Hungary, that's pretty important because the regime does use uh, EU structural funds uh, for political purposes. Uh, less so, I would say, in, in Poland, but certainly in Hungary. And the reasons, you know, I, I would not put Sweden in the same camp as Germany in any, by any stretch of the imagination in terms of trying to take a, an approach to combating the, the Hungarian government in terms of its use of, the, of uh, EU structures. Uh, and so at the same time, uh, backsliding democratically, particularly because of the fact that the Ger in Germany, there is a strong link between the CDU, CSU, and, uh, or there was the Fidesz party of Viktor Orban, and between the German automate or, or automotive industry and uh, and Hungarian business, and so that 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 has been a long sort of long standing uh, issue that has undermined the ability of the EU to respond to uh, backsliding in Hungary. Maybe I'd add if I could add one point regarding uh, Lisa's mention of the Summit for Democracy. I think that while the summit shouldn't um, in, in itself create a new structure, I do think that it's important that it's not an event and is more a process. It's a beginning of something. And I think that that's what, that's what it's, it's important to use it as sort of galvanizing and also think about what, you know, what those commitments, what do they mean uh, and what could they mean in the future? Rachel, you had a piece that came out on the sanctions related to China, where I think you ended it by noting a sort of mention of the Helsinki Accords. And there, you know, people didn't get together thinking this is what it would, this is what it's going to be in a few years' time. But, you know, the fact that countries came together and did discuss in itself was important and did lead to significant uh, changes over the, over the long run. And I think this is an opportunity uh, as well. One of the reasons I must say that we brought up the Helsinki Accords at the end of that piece, which I co-wrote with Stephen Feldstein, and I should say that the Middle Powers piece was co-written with a whole host of my um, my democracy, conflict, and governance team here, uh, was that it, it was one of the key moments that I think did a great deal um, to affect the international democracy space, not only through the state action, but through the actions of citizens within what was then the Soviet Union, taking it seriously and taking it up being supported by citizens from around the world. And it was one of the early moments of state citizen interaction on these issues so that it wasn't um, one or the other, but them coming together. And um, I think it, that's been an important uh, lesson that we can take forward in how we treat these issues of democracy and human rights and also anti-corruption. And that brings me to my question for you, Lisa. Ken had said that anti-corruption might be a particularly a touchy issue for the EU. I understand completely why that would be. Um, it's a touchy issue for all of us, I would say, maybe with the exception of Canada, um, because uh, if you're a major financial center, then you're implicated in the problem. Um, this is not just wagging your finger at some other country. This is dealing with the fact that a lot of uh, beneficial ownership is happening within Delaware, within New York, within London, within uh, clearly Switzerland is a, is a significant hotbed of these problems. And so, um, Lisa, I would love to know how much you're um, taking up the issue of anti-corruption within the DRL Bureau, um, how much this is front of mind for the United States and our thinking about democracy, because clearly yesterday I was hosting an event on political marketplace systems, which is what um, LSC is calling uh, basically kleptocratic systems that are being run for constant conflict to continue using um, corruption and violence as kind of the currency of the realm. And these are very easy systems for kleptocratic, autocratic countries to manipulate because they're very comfortable putting money into these systems and keeping the conflict going. Um, and that causes a huge amount of trouble for the United States if we want to stop the conflict in one way or another. And so it's very much in our self-interest to not have kleptocratic regimes winning the day and, and a kleptocratic system taking hold 
but that means dealing with our own cross-cutting interests at home. So to, to put a pin in it, is corruption in a frontline interest for DRL now and for the administration now? And how might that instantiate itself in this agenda? So, you know, I, this is my second go around in DRL and, and Tom Malinowski was the assistant secretary during most of my first time in DRL. And he, at that moment, actually came into the Bureau very keen to ramp up the Bureau's work on corruption because we, we come at it through the governance lens, whereas the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, which really has the most substantial engagement on corruption in the department, comes at it from a much more um, law enforcement um, investigatory approach. We, we are definitely interested in DRL, but don't necessarily have the bandwidth to in increase our game extensively. I will say with the new administration coming in, there have been um, sporadic conversations around the need to perhaps look more holistically at corruption so that it's not, you know, just DRL looking from this, this governance lens and INL looking from this law enforcement lens, but really looking at it more holistically and how is the department um, as a whole taking on this issue and looking at it in a way that really hits all of the levers that we need to be hitting. I think the area where this is really going to hit our screens um, most immediately is on the migration concern. Um, and as you look in the discussions around the root causes of migration, corruption in Central America repeatedly comes up. And so that gets back to the point of looking at corruption from a wider lens, because it is something that has more, has immediate impacts on our domestic environment beyond what you've already mentioned in terms of safe havens and, and the ways in which money gets touched here. So I do think, and, and corruption is one of the lines of focus for the Democracy Summit as well. So I think you're going to be hearing a lot more and seeing much more concerted thinking around um, corruption from the State Department as a whole going forward. Thank you. Um, Roland, migration was one of the issues that touched off some of the latest populist rise across Europe, um, across other parts of the world too. Uh, clearly it's had a big effect in America and it's one of the issues you touch on in your paper. Um, as an area that could be moved forward. And it's not one that we talk about in our paper because frankly, it hadn't occurred to me. Um, and so it hadn't occurred to any of us. And so I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about what you think could be done on the migration scale to modernize our um, migration systems and perhaps use migration as an area that can shore up democracy itself. Yeah, and, and I should say that that paper you reference, uh, my paper for Chatham House, wasn't specifically about democracy. It was talking more about, uh, you know, liberal values, uh, including values of maintaining a kind of um, the integrity of a global migration regime, uh, including the elements of uh, refugee determination, resettlement, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it's clearly everything is connected to everything else in the end, right? Which speaks to the importance of choosing priorities and countries committing to specific uh, issues. But migration is clearly fits into this discussion in a number of different ways. We saw the migration flows in Europe, you know, reinforce trends towards, uh, you know, uh, a, a liberal populism. Uh, we're seeing its effects in Latin America. Um, the the regime itself is complete is so overburdened that it it requires fundamental renovation. But uh, as big as that task is, and I think that we should not uh, dismiss the importance of fundamental renovation, uh, there are smaller scale things that are 
conceivably possible to do that could have an impact. So for example, you have uh, millions of children who are in uh, long-term displacement situations. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're, they are uh, displaced people uh, and they have very little prospect of returning home, yet they have very little prospect of resettlement. And we know that these situations are lasting longer and longer, you know, coming up to an average of 20 years. You're talking about a generation of people who are, many of them are not having, uh, getting education, even primary education. They're certainly not getting the older uh, youth uh, skills training or any, you know, a livelihoods opportunity. It's a recipe for disaster. For a for recurrence of the social ills that could lead to inc increased drives for, uh, you know, for mass movements that could have disruptive effects on democratic and other countries, and also for radicalization, as we've seen uh, over and over again. So these are all interconnected issues. And in, in relation to Central America, of course, you know, the, the migration challenges, we know how complicated those are and how connected they are to governance issues. It's not just an anti-corruption issue, although it's clearly uh, that's really important. Even things like how those countries, that the, the way in which they are able to manage migration within the countries, manage their borders. Uh, there is a technical assistance side to this uh, as well. Let me just add one last thought because we were talking before about the summit uh, for democracies. And, and I think, and I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that this is conceived of as a kind of pledging process, uh, like nuclear, nuclear security summit uh, model, um, because I just don't think that there's any potential to have the kind of one democracy forum to rule them all, so to speak, as, 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 as lovely as in a way that would be. We're just not going to have that, not just because it's hard, but because the issues under the umbrella of democracy support imply different groupings of actors. And some of them will be, you know, five eyes. Some of them will be, you know, maybe quad plus. Some of them will be NATO. Some of them will be G7. Some of them will be G20. Some of them will be these task-specific coalitions. I mean, the, pro the difficulty that I've had in, in these discussions, and all of us have been in involved in discussions about democracy support over the last while, is that they often fall into debates about organizational forms. And, uh, and, and you'll get the creation of new institutions that don't have a specific function already worked out for them. So my plea is, let's focus on specific things that need to be done and get the right people around the table to do those specific things. It's less than perfect, but it's more likely to actually produce the results we need. Uh, here, here. Thank you, Roland. Um, and we have one minute left and one question left. So Ken, with just, uh, with just one minute, our uh, audience member has asked about climate change and this narrative that you need a benevolent dictator to get it done and the frustration among many climate activists. And you had said climate was actually one of the low hanging fruit for Europe that you thought Europe would be able to ta tackle. How can you handle uh, that narrative challenge? What do you think Europe can do to say, no, no, this is one that we democracies actually can take and um, and do something about in a near enough term and counter this narrative that what we really need is a is a strong man to deal with the climate crisis. That's not an easy one to answer in one minute. Sorry. But, uh, I, what, what, some of the things I think democracies are badly placed often to deal with this issue just because of the short termism of the way that uh, democratic decision making often occurs. However, I would say that. You know, evidence does point to the fact that on the environment, democracies are much stronger than authoritarian regimes. So intuitively, it may seem as though there are reasons for democracies to be uh, poor at dealing with particular long term issues. I would say at the European level, what is it show what it has shown is the willingness or need to cooperate above the level of the nation state. So really thinking about, OK, we need to make commitments that are not, you know, we can't solve this problem on our own. So we need to we need to cooperate on it. So there's a drive towards greater cooperation in terms of the the plea of some uh, people in order to deal with the fact that this is such a big crisis in terms of the climate and the fact that decisions need to be taken 
that uh, might go against um, democratic principles. I think that having those positions is uh, all well and well and good. I think that, that you can make a case for having that position. I think the unintended consequences of that position would be extremely severe for for citizens and for for. Uh, people across the globe because you have no idea exactly what that type of uh, political regime would do in many other different types of areas. So I think it's a, it's a much deeper question than I'm able to answer in, in a couple of minutes. Apologies. I wanted to uh, I wanted to get our audience in and yet um, I recognize that they're asking very serious questions and um, we could all take a whole day to answer most of them on there. So I'm sorry for those of you who I didn't get to your questions. Some of them the neoliberal critique we could spend a whole graduate seminar on um, and we only had an hour but please join me in thanking our speakers Lisa, Ken and Roland you did just a masterful job in a short period of time. Thank you very much and may we all go on to do good work uh, that moves all of this forward. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>